Welcome to today's guest webinar about build your own over the air updatable embedded Linux distribution from prototype to production, presented by our partner Foundries.io. Before we dive into the webinar, a few organizational things. So first, this webinar will be available uh, as a video later, so we will we'll be uh, able to watch it uh, online. Um, if you have any questions, uh, there is a chat uh, feature. So if you have questions about uh, or, or comments that the webinar doesn't run correctly, then you can hear and it's like that, put that in the chat question. And then at the end, we also have a live Q&A and you can ask questions while the webinar is going on. For that, you find a question tab in the webinar tool and you can just enter it there and we will pick it up at the end of the webinar and answer that for you. We will also have a poll. So while the webinar is going on, pay attention and we will ask you a short question and you will be giving, you will be able to give us an answer uh, live here in the webinar. Okay, with that, uh, let's get started. So today we have uh, Tyler Baker uh, with us. He's the CTO of Foundries.io and he will lead through most of the webinar. My name is Daniel Lang and I'm the CMO uh, of Toradex. First, a very brief introduction uh, who is Toradex, if you don't know uh, who we are. Uh, so we are focusing on uh, making embedded computing easy and that means on the hardware side and uh, simplify the design, but also on the software side and make it easier for you. Uh, we really focus on the reliable ARM system on modules. Uh, we try to provide the lowest cost of ownership and that doesn't mean just bomb cost, it means development cost, it means maintenance cost, uh, it means, means time to market and so on. And we are very proud of our industry leading support. And um, I think it's always interesting to know a little bit what are the target customers uh, of companies so you know why we do certain things a certain way and you can see if you maybe fit in, in one of these markets. So we have a very wide range of vertical markets. Here are just our top ones. It's industrial automation, medical devices, test and measurement, transportation, which is supercar, trains, buses, things like that, smart city, which is a lot of access control, cameras and so on. Typical volumes uh, for our customers are from a few hundred to a few 10,000 pieces a year. And um, very brief, our product, so we have two lines of uh, system on modules, one called Apalis, the other one called Colibri. And within the family, these modules are pin compatible. So you can scale from a single core A7 to a multi-core A72 system with GPUs, and, and, and so on. So it's very easy to move and also on the software side, we make it easy for you uh, to move up or down. Um, we mostly sell these models, but we also focusing a lot on software. So we do a lot with the Yocto project, we provide Linux, you can get Android and, and from third parties. Uh, so you can really get the model and the software from Torad. The software uh, we will focusing on today on the, on the Toradex side, which runs on the module is called Torizon. And it's a Linux distribution and I show he you here a little bit some of the main goals. So we, we wanted to make that uh, provide a fast time to market. So it's basically ready to use out of the box. We will provide a, a way to do simple updates. And that's really where Foundries, uh, for example, plays in here and extends on Horizon and provide that OTA service. Uh, security, of course, important on um, embedded devices in, in this target market. Real time, so we have a real time option. Uh, this Linux real time, so it's the, the RT patch. Uh, stable, what does that mean? That means that we use modern uh, continuous integration verification tests so we can provide stable releases um, on a high frequency. And then we use open source technology so you don't have a login and you can modify it for your own project. And so I think that's very nice. Then a little bit more details. So that Horizon is based on the Linux micro platform, which comes from Foundries. So we, that's when we start to begin to work with Foundries. And um, it's built on Open Embedded and the Yocto project. So if you know Toradex, you know we are very strong uh, support of the Yocto project. And, and that's the common way to develop projects so far. And we still build on top of that. So you can still use Yocto if you want to just use that. 
and then Torizon is basically a higher layer. And to provide some of the advantages you saw on the slide before, we, we use a software containerization. So we use the uh, Docker container runtime. Uh, software containerization means you basically pack all the dependency of an application in a, in a container and then run, um, run that on the system. So you're less dependencies and it's, it's like a lightweight virtual machine a little. And uh, then uh, that also gives us access to the container ecosystem. So you can tap into uh, a Docker Hub and, and find Docker container. And we also work with, with our partners like Qt, Crank, Codesys, and many more to provide containers for Horizon. Uh, so you can use a UI or a soft PLC and so on. Uh, for a simple out of the box experience, we, we support the Debian package manager. So you can get just get these packages for, for a very you know, easy proof, proof of concept. Uh, we have integration with Visual Studio. We support .NET Core. That's very interesting for people moving from, uh, uh, from Microsoft. And of course, all the Linux-based development tools are also available. Uh, we also have a range of development tools for device configuration or flash analytics, which show you, for example, the, the lifetime of your, of your flash, which can be very uh, useful in an embedded device. So we start, I like to, to hand over uh, to Foundries. Um, so a few words about Foundries from, from Toradex. So before we started with the Horizon project, uh, we did a very detailed market analysis. We, we had a survey for over 2000 people uh, responding and we looked at different technologies available and we really found that Foundry uh, Linux micro platform is a really good base going forward. It's, it's easy to, to maintain. And since then we work with them and we are very happy. And, and so I like to hand over to Tyler, which will show you how you can integrate Horizon in their update factory and in their offering. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so I'm Tyler Baker. I'm the chief technology officer at boundaries.io. Um, thank you for joining us today, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, so my background is in, in embedded systems. Um, I worked building products at Honeywell for a, a long period of time. Um, and then uh, most recently I was working uh, on open source software on ARM SOCs at Lenaro before we spun out to Foundries. So I've got an interesting background in building and shipping products and also working with open source software. Um, I'm really excited to collaborate with Torix on this webinar. Uh, I think both our companies really have the same mindset when it comes to how to build the next generation of platform software um, and how it should be created and maintained. So with that said, I'm not going to bore you with slides too much. There's going to be a lot of live demos, but we do have to kind of run through a few uh, things first to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about later. So that being said, what I'm going to do now is, and I'm going to show you a quick video uh, of what we're doing with the boards here. So we're using an Apollos IMX6 module, um, and we're going to provision it with the, the uh, Horizon uh, platform using the Easy Installer. Now, this build is a little bit different uh, than potentially what you've seen before. I'll go ahead and click the video. Our build from the Foundry Factory, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, will produce an Easy Installer image, which you can simply load over USB. And then I'm using VNC here to, to actually write the image uh, into the flash. Um, so this is just to show um, how you would take an image that you create. Uh, and, and initially provision the device. The next step we'll see is how we, we actually register the device with the Foundry services. And then at that point, uh, it'll be, be able to be managed. So what we're gonna do here is we provision the device with Easy Installer. Uh, we've logged in via SSH. We're gonna run a tool called LMP Device Register. And what this does is it basically allows uh, it, a particular device to register with a server. And then it's gonna do a challenge here. So there's a user code that you'll copy and paste and it provides you the URL to activate the device and to claim it in your user account. So that was a simple process there. And eventually the device will tell you that uh, it's registered and it's ready to go. So we're gonna use that as the basis uh, from where we start from in this presentation. Okay, so let's go through a few slides real quick and then we'll get into some demos. So what I wanna talk about is building prototypes both at the, the base platform level and uh, an application, but let's start with the applications first. So uh, we wanna build a cute application using Python and Docker why would we use Docker? I think Daniel uh, mentioned it a little bit, is it provides really good isolation between kind of your, your, your base platform, Horizon in this case, and the application runtime. Um, it provides reproducibility so that you're able to move it around uh, very easily uh, to different platforms. Um, and it, it's fairly easy to update as well. Um, and so, you know, if your application is very complex, you can keep the complexity out of the operating system. 
So what are we going to build today? It's going to be really, really simple. Um, it's just going to be a Debian container. Uh, as, as Daniel mentioned, the, that tooling should be very familiar to you. Uh, it's going to use a PySide 2 framework, um, and then it's going to just output hello, hello Docker to the HDMI screen on the Apollos. Uh, and we're going to run it in a one-shot configuration. So we're going to run it from the command line um, that will start up and it will display on the screen. So let's take a look at how we would do that now. So here's the board and module with the HDMI screen. Um, in the upper left corner here, I've got a SSH terminal that's into the device, and we'll start there. So the first thing we want to look at is this Docker file that I've created. Um, so it's it's very, very simple. So we're inheriting from the Debian Buster image. We're adding FB set and the PySide 2 packages that we need, and that's it. So a uh, very simple runtime. Uh, and then we're copying in this Qt demo.py and a startup script, which I'll explain in a moment here. So let's just take a quick look at the Qt demo script. So Tordex has this on their website. Uh, it's a simple, cute example. Um, and this is a, you know, more or less uh, just taking that and, and, and formalizing it a little bit. So what do we have here? Um, we're going to create a label. It says, hello, Docker. Uh, we're going to use the Arial font. It's going to be font size 60. We're going to align it to the center, and we're going to show it. It's dead simple. Um, the startup script is going to set the resolution for the screen and then just run the demo. So there's nothing nothing really uh, too complicated there. So the first thing we need to do is build this thing. And I'll show you the build script. I just scripted it so it's a little bit easier. So we're just going to go ahead and run it. And just in the interest of time, I've already pre-built everything. So it should just use the cache layers when it builds. And OK, there we are. So let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. OK, hey, that looks pretty nice. Now, um, the application's running right now. I'm going to go Control-C and, and kill the application. However, it's already written the memory to the frame buffer, so it's going to keep displaying it until we change it. And, and that's what we're going to kind of talk about next. So that's a simple prototype. Our goals were to get it functional and to get something on the screen, and, and we've kind of accomplished that. So let's go back to the slides here for a second and talk about how we would refine this prototype. So, so why is this not a great prototype? Well, because um, it's, it's not really flexible in, in how you would deploy it. Uh, so there's a, a, a software piece called Docker Compose, uh, and it allows you to define services. So you could have, you know, a cute application. You could have, you know, a, a other applications running alongside uh, that cute application, uh, and you want to be able to define them in, in this kind of language. Uh, it allows flexibility when you're adding other services. You also don't want to hard code like the message that you want to display on the screen and the font size particularly. So uh, Docker Compose allows you to pass them as environment variables and then kind of allows dynamic configuration. So what we're going to do um, is we can also run the service uh, and set the reboot flag. So when the platform reboots, uh, it'll start back up the application. So it, it's almost like you've taken an application and created a daemon for it. So let's take a look at what we would need to do um, to make that happen. So if we go back here. Uh, you'll notice I've kind of prepared some stuff. So let's just take a quick look at the Docker Compose file. So I haven't changed anything else yet. Um, but you'll notice I've got these environment variables here called hello docker compose this is the message and then the font size uh, same image and everything like that. Now what we need to do is modify uh, the Qt demo script to actually take those environment variables. So I've already kind of done that for us. Um, so we're just going to copy Qt demo.py and we're going to rebuild the container. And it's going to copy it in. It's only going to uh, redo those layers there. And so if we cat this file out, what we can see is now we're looking for if uh, Qt font size is set, then use it. And if the message is set, then we use that message as well. So we can kind of parameterize that, and that's the Qt message up here. So if we do now, we'll just take a look, make sure we're not running any containers. No containers are running. So if we do a Docker Compose up, what we should see is hello uh, Docker Compose on the screen here just a moment once it starts. It'll rewrite that, that memory in the frame buffer, and our new messages will be displayed. OK, so now hello Docker Compose is running. So we've kind of taken um, you know, the start of our prototype. We've put it into a better format that's easier to manage um, just because uh, you know, we can set things like, uh, like the reboot flag and, and things like that. So uh, this is a little bit easier to manage. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop this right now, and I'll set it to run in daemon mode. Um, and then we can, we can do the next part of the presentation here. So this will stop it. Perfect. OK, let's take one more quick look at it. Um, and the restart flag is set. So if I run this in daemon mode now, 
the screen won't change, but we'll show that the service is running. And so the next part of this is we're going to actually update the base operating system on this Apollos. Um, and uh, we can see once we reboot the platform that the service still runs and that the display uh, is displayed properly. Okay, so take a quick look. Okay, we're up and running. Now let's go back to our slide deck for just a second. You're probably thinking to yourself, well, what's, this is this is a whole bunch of manual work. I mean, how does this even scale? And, and you're absolutely right if that's what you're thinking. Um, so even though Docker Compose allows us to deploy it a little bit manually without having a bunch of scripts, you know, these changes, at least in this case, are not under version control. It's an easy fix. You could put it into Git. Um, but how would you deploy this on a bunch of different devices? If you had uh, 10,000 devices in your fleet, how would you deploy this application across all of them? And how would you manage it? How would you update them all? Well, there's various solutions, right? There's like Ansible, uh, there's Kubernetes, um, but, but a lot of those technologies, you know, don't really fit great when you're talking about embedded systems, um, and especially uh, embedded systems that need uh, configuration, um, you know, deployed. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I think the big thing too is, is security, right? Uh, Docker re registries are usually not providing signed images, and we are. Uh, and then we, we have a unique way to embed um, these Docker applications inside a signed manifest as well. So when they're delivered to the platform itself to update, uh, you know, we have an end-to-end -end security flow, which we'll talk about in a moment. So um, let's just talk about our product real quick, Foundry's Factory. This is the piece that allows you to, to change everything about the platform. So really, it enables you to build your own custom embedded Linux platform, test it, manage it and OTA your software. So, so literally uh, within you know, 10 minutes, you can create your own factory on our website, uh, configure it for your hardware platform, change anything you want about the operating system, uh, create your own applications and deploy it privately. So everything is, is it's your own private space to do your development work where you have managed infrastructure. And, and why do we think this is, this is helpful? Well, um, with any base like Horizon or our Linux micro platform, as soon as you change something, uh, that's not in the upstream software, it's impossible almost to update that unless you have your own infrastructure. So what we decided to do was to build out, uh, you know, a self-service infrastructure that allows you to build, you know, your own customized based image and applications and deploy them, um, you know, to, to devices that you register. So what this allows you to do is, is maintain uh, the base operating system, make sure you can deliver kernel, uh, bootloader, and user space updates but also allows you to have your own private um, Docker app store. And I'll talk about that in a moment where you can define the applications that, that get delivered to your, uh, your platform. So what does this help you do? This helps you take your prototype that you've kind of built by hand and put it into a managed environment uh, that you control and that, uh, that you can roll out and update uh, pretty much every piece of software on this device. So that is the really powerful thought. And I'll get into more of the, the specifics of the Foundry's Factory in a little bit, but that's the general 50,000 foot overview of, of what we can provide. So what does it take to update the base OS, you might ask? Um, let's just take a perfect example. So I need to add a package to this, this image that's running on the Apollos board that I've been showing you. Um, and typically, if you're debugging application, S-Trace is, is a great tool to use to debug applications that are running on the, uh, on the platform. So let's, let's go ahead and, and add that. Um, now, in the, the interest of time, again, I've already pushed this, um, this change, and, and that's kind of how this works with the, with the factory. So when you push a change um, into a privately hosted Git repository that we set up for you as part of the Foundry's factory, the platform image itself gets rebuilt, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, and not only the platform image itself, but it, the OTA image, so the, the Delta upgrade uh, that's needed uh, is also published and hosted for you. So once the update's applied, um, you know, we have to reboot the platform to actually apply it. And then um, any, any app deployment that you were running with the restart flag will come back up. So let's just take a look at what this actually looks like in practice. So here is the patch that I pushed. Um, you know, basically adding S trace. So I just, you know, there's there's a recipes images Tordex factory image dot bb uh, defines the packages that are in uh, the base operating system. I've just added S trace here. So if we uh, go back here and take a look at the CI builds, so this is this is all the builds for the Tordex factory. Uh, you can see that I've added S trace here. Uh, that's build sixty three. So let's go back to the platform here and just take a quick look. Let's clear this. And I'm going to use this client called the Actualizer Lite. And this is something that we helped develop uh, and upstream into the Actualizer pro uh, project. And it's the client that's going to deal with everything um, about updates. So what it's going to do is it's going to fetch the latest updates. And so we can kind of see here that, um, hey, there's image 63. That's there. I saw that in the, the CI screen. But now I want to know, what am I, what is this platform actually running? 
Well, it's running Active Image 62, so there's an update out there. Now, typically Actualizer Lite runs in daemon mode, but for this demonstration, I've taken it out of daemon mode and I'm just using the command line tools by hand. I think it's a little bit easier to follow when you're doing updates because you manually trigger them. Otherwise, uh, this thing would have already updated and we wouldn't have seen anything. So let's go ahead and apply the uh, base operating system update. Now, as uh, I think Daniel mentioned this, uh, we're using OS tree and we're securing it with the update framework. So uh, OS tree is like Git for your file system. It keeps everything uh, under version control and there's different like uh, objects, which are like layers in Git or, uh, or refs in Git. And so uh, what I'm pulling down is essentially just the bit to add S trace that I need and anything that linked with it. So uh, very, very small use in bandwidth when you're talking about updating over the air, as long as it's, uh, you know, you're not changing everything about your, your platform or you haven't recompiled your platform with a new compiler, uh, it's going to be very, very small. Um, and it's done securely because we are using um, signed images through OS tree and we're using a signed manifest to deliver it securely with this client. So um, it's also another thing that we've done is we worked with secure elements and we have implementations that use secure elements to back uh, the actualizer client and store the TLS keys securely and, and have all of the cryptographic off operations offloaded as well. So, uh, you know, you can even embed, uh, you know, hardware security in this update mechanism as well uh, to, to, to both secure Docker apps, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the base operating system updates. So what's happening here is uh, we, we pulled down the OS tree, now we're getting ready to apply it. Um, okay, great, so now this is done. Now, I, before we reboot this thing, I was gonna show you that S-Trace isn't actually installed, so it can't be found. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and, and reboot this right now. Now this all happens normally. When you have the daemon running, this will automatically happen, but. Just for demo purposes, we're going to do this manually for you. Okay, there we go. So now we're booting. So what we should expect when this boots back up and we can get back in, let's see if it's back up and then it works up yet, uh, is that S-Trace is going to be there. Uh, the other thing that we should expect is that the Docker containers are going to start as well, and so we should see hello Docker Compose. Still might not be up yet. Okay, there it is. Okay, and let's check our S-Trace. Hey, we have S trace now. That was great. So what you're gonna see, and let's see if I can catch it before it actually happens, uh, is that the Docker daemon's looking at everything. Yep, it just started a second ago. And hey, look, our, our daemon, our prototype that we had put in place with Docker Compose has come back up after we've done an operating system update. The whole system is functional. Uh, and I think it's also important to note as we're doing that base operating system update, the system was functioning. So it was it was running our application. Uh, nothing stopped that application from running while the update was was uh, being downloaded and being applied. Uh, simply a reboot was all that was needed to actually apply that. So what you kind of see in the summary is uh, us deliver uh, a new piece of user space over the air incrementally, uh, securely using the update framework. Uh, and and uh, building a, a basic prototype application with Docker and then Docker Compose. So at this point now, let's switch back here. I wanna do a quick poll with everybody. Um, and this is just gonna take 10 seconds of your time. We have two things. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about how familiar you are with containerization and, and how, uh, you know, if you've ever used remote update uh, frameworks before to update your software. So please just take a moment. It's really helpful for us and, and myself to understand how we should guide our, our future conversation. Uh, based on these results. Okay, so we got the results in here. Um, so kind of mixed across the board. Um, looks like we have some experts here. They, they're very familiar with built their own containers. That's good to see. Our last session, there wasn't a whole lot of people. So that's great. I think it's gonna get uh, pretty technical here in a moment and that will be good uh, because you guys will have a lot of context uh, around this. So yeah, um, pretty good. Okay, so that, that's good. Let's do the next poll here. And it's, do you currently use a remote update service? So just go ahead and, and uh, you know, let us know if you've done it before. Um, and again, if you have questions about the update service that we're offering uh, with Foundry's Factory uh, or anything about Horizon, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them at the end of this. So we're about halfway through. Um, the next part of our journey is, is gonna be talking about managed Docker applications and using Docker, Docker app spec uh, to deliver them. And so let's see our results here. Okay, so this was actually uh, pretty consistent with our last session. Not a lot of people have done it. Now, I built uh, a products before, I totally understand it. And, and what I always tell people is, we always wanna do, you know, have security in our products and have a way to update it. But when you look at uh, project roadmaps, those are kind of like the last two things you get to. And what do we know about products? Uh, is that either the, the schedules get extended because there's delays in, in hardware or software engineering, or uh, the schedules get brought in because we wanna get to market quickly. And, and those kind of things, get left by the wayside. 
That is exactly why we're building Foundry's factory and, and working with Horizon uh, and Tordex is because we want to be able to provide this service, like a really, really low cost service. So you don't have to build this yourself uh, and that you can just leverage all of this great open source stack that we have, uh, uh, you know, and, and build your product off of it. Okay, uh, let's go back to sharing my screen here. So let's talk about managing containers. So we, we have Docker Compose running. I just I just actually brought it down on the screen or on the Apollo board because we're going to do it in a managed way now. So what do I mean by managing containers? Well, um, well there's a thing called Docker Apps, um, and it's a cloud native application bundle specification. It allows you to define um, you know context around your Docker Compose definition essentially. So uh, what we provide in Foundry's factory allows you to build the actual container images themselves, sign those images, and place them into a private registry, and do it from multiple architectures. So if, you're, if you have a deployment of x86 boards, uh, ARM32 and ARM64 boards, it can be really hard to, to manage all the software on it. The nice thing about Foundry's factory is we built from a single source tree for all those platforms. So uh, you have the same kernel version, you'll have all the same uh, user space versions of software uh, between all those architectures, and the same will be true with containers. Um, so it's kind of a, this really nice way of, of dealing with kind of the complexity of software across multiple processor architectures. Um, it also provides a turnkey way to publish Docker apps to a tough manifest that allows us to securely deliver Docker applications to a platform, uh, not only because the manifest itself is signed, the images themselves are signed and verified by the target, but uh, a lot of times, which you'll see like on Docker Hub is people use the latest tag, which is great, but that thing can that can change and there's no way to go back and to roll back if, if the application didn't work. So we actually use uh, the SHA uh, of, of the source built to uh, you to tag and then that's published directly into this manifest which tells the the update client actualizer light which exact container to pull that way if there's a problem uh, we, we know which one to roll back to so let's go to this one um, so what are we gonna do we're gonna take everything we did uh, with our docker build and we're gonna import it into uh, the founders factory containers .git repo and then we're gonna push commit to trigger a new build uh, we're also going to uh, create a Docker app, which is a definition. Again, I, I mentioned it's a cloud native application bundle specification. So again, open specification. Uh, and it's basically allowing you to take a Docker Compose service and become generic. And what do I mean by generic? Well, if you think about an application, you want your application to be generic and you want uh, you know, your platform or your users to configure it to their use case. And so uh, that's what Docker apps allow you to do. And then we want to deploy it. Uh, once it's been built and published, we want to securely deploy it to the platform. So let's just take a look at how we might go about doing something like that. Okay, so let's I'm gonna switch down to this window here. This is on my host. And what we have here is a Git repo called containers.git. It comes from Foundry's factory. You get this as part of uh, um, your subscription when you subscribe. And what do we have here? So we've got a few things. So uh, Python 3QT, this was um, essentially a folder, a directory inside of here. And what do we have? Well, there's a Docker file. It's exactly the same as what we had running on the host. And then we have QT demo. It's exactly the same. And our startup script here. So essentially just copy and paste it over uh, into uh, this folder here. Now, the, the change here is that we have another file called Python 3-QT Docker app. So let's take a look at what's inside of that. Uh, this, this, should, this should look interesting. Um, so you've got a little bit of context here. You've got a version, you've got a name, you've got a description, and then you've got these dash marks here. And then everything underneath those dash marks looks awful familiar. And if you're wondering where you've seen that before, that is essentially a copy and paste from the Docker Compose. However, instead of hard coding um, the, the platform and frame buffer device variables and the message and font size, uh, we've made them into variables which are parameterized. Um, so here we have like a default set, but each device can override these. So uh, you could have 50 devices that have a particular message that you want to display that locally could be configured to have that different message, even though uh, the defaults here are being set in the server. So it gives you a little bit of flexibility to kind of, uh, you know, twist some, twist some knobs and, uh, you know, see kind of, you know, how you can change things. Now, I believe, let's take a look at the target here. So if I do sudo actualizer light dash light list. Okay, so you see this bit here called Docker apps. So I've already gone ahead and published uh, uh, some Docker app file uh, already. I think this is from probably the previous uh, um, 
uh, session. So what we're going to do is, since it's already a target, we can just enable it and have it have it work. So let me just check, make sure no Docker processes are running right now. Okay, good. So there's a config file called soda.toml, and there's a little entry called Docker apps. Right now, we're not configured for anything, right? But if I configure for Python Qt, we'll do another list. You don't have to do this, but I just do this so we can show. Okay, so uh, now we're going to run an update. And what should we see? So what's going to happen is it's going to look at the, the the tough manifest and say, hey, yeah, I, I do understand that there's a new target called Python 3 Qt. Let me know more about that. And then it's going to say, okay, here's the image that you need to pull. And it's going to pull that image. Uh, it's going to pull the Docker app. And it's going to render it into a compose file and start it for you on your behalf and manage that deployment. So what we should see here in a moment is uh, hello webinar be displayed on the screen. Uh, and that's actually coming from our Docker app. So we've kind of taken something that and you can see the gradual progression here where we build on the target, we build a Docker container and we get it to work. And then we bring it into Docker Compose because it's a little bit easier to add services to it uh, and, and, and keep it running and, and run it in daemon mode uh, and all of that stuff. So and now we're taking that, all of those pieces that we built on for our prototype here. There we go, hello webinar. Uh, and, and now we've, we've deployed a managed application. Let me show you how it's managed. Um, so if I go in here, and I just go and say, hello, Docker app. We'll just make a, a simple change. We get a sign by commit. And we push it. We'll just make sure everything's going on okay with the polar. Yeah, we're going really good here. Um, and so, what will happen is um, the Foundries factory, and this is the Tordex Foundries factory here, uh, we'll, we'll see that change get pushed. And once that, that change gets pushed, we're gonna build containers. Um, and so this is kind of where all the magic happens. So while that's building, I, I do wanna just kind of run you through uh, like the difference between a container build and a platform build. So as you saw here, you know, we had a platform build um, and literally this builds Yocto for you. I mean, the whole shebang. So all of this, and we have uh, estate cache for all of our factories. So the, the initial build that you get when you create your factory does take a little bit of time. I think it's like under an hour, but then any builds that uh, that you follow up with are incrementally built. And so they take, you know, anywhere from like 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, still a little long to do on a webinar, but uh, you do also get access to all of the output files. So uh, if you're a kernel guy, you might be really interested in the kernel config, uh, wanting to know what the final config looks like. Um, if you're, you know, kind of a firmware person doing bootloader work, you know, you have all the bootloader pre-built binaries as well. You have, uh, you know, the OS tree repo tarball, if you wanted to, you know, have your own OS tree server or, or whatnot. Um, but basically even gives you all the compiled DTBs and things like that. So you get these pre-built images, uh, you know, as well as an update uh, uh, from this as well. So let's just go back here and see if we picked it up. Okay, so we, we have another job, it's, it's 64. So what, what's gonna happen is once this new Docker app is published, uh, I'll have build 64 I can update to. And when I update to build 64, uh, Actualizer Lite will say, hey, there's a, a new change to the configuration of this container. Let's pull it down. Let's run it. We should see hello Docker app on the screen. And then, um, you know, the platform won't need to reboot because it's just a container, right? We don't need to actually, we didn't change the base operating system. There's nothing to do there. So I'll kind of show you how, what this looks like. As it's running, there's not a whole lot there. Uh, so this is going to build just for ARMHF, but we do, again, build for uh, x86 and uh, ARM32 and ARM64 as well. So if that's something that's interesting to you, um, then we could do that as well. Let me see what else we have in the slides here. Okay, so yeah, well, this is kind of what we're doing here. Um, I guess we can give a factory walkthrough um, while we're doing this. So when I talk about the Foundries factory, what am I actually talking about? So when you sign up, uh, so you can sign in for free. If you want a factory, we have two kind of levels right now. So there's $10 a month, which will allow you to have access to everything I'm showing you today. Uh, and you can manage up to 10 devices. So you can push builds, you can push containers, uh, you can manage your devices uh, all for $10 a month. Um, and then we have an enterprise. So if, you, if you're serious about doing this and you wanna build a product on it, like many of our customers have done, uh, they choose the $5,000 a month option. Uh, which gives you on-device hardware testing. It gives you unlimited builds and unlimited devices. So kind of an all-you-can-eat uh, factory, if you will. So if you go to factories here, uh, you can create your own factory. So you give it a name, you give it a description, and you create it. And essentially what you get 
uh, you get you know your own your own space uh, where you can do development. So you get uh, meta subscriber overrides, LMP manifest, and these kind of relate to the platform software. So you can bring in uh, Yocto layers, uh, you can add drivers, uh, you can do whatever you'd like. You can change your kernel out very easily. Uh, and then you know here's where I was adding S trace. So I was going into it here, just you know adding this bit here and pushing it and it built the platform for me and it provided the OTA update and then it offered to, to any registered platform. So you get that out of the box with Foundry's Factory, the source code hosting. Um, you also get, so if you go in here, this is one of the factories, uh, you can invite members. So if you have a team of people that are working on your platform software or the application software, you can invite them in uh, even for $10 a month uh, and, and collaborate with them in this, this source code factory. You get a private Docker registry with signing capabilities. You get the build system uh, and you also uh, you get a device management framework here. So if you click on devices, uh, you can see all the devices that are registered. So uh, I believe this is the one that we're working with right now. And what you can see is what apps are configured on it. When it checks in, you can find the IP address. Uh, you can find out when it was last seen. All of that stuff is available on the web UI. So you get that for $10 a month if, if you decide to do it. So let's check on our build right now and see where we're at. Okay, so uh, RMHF container build passed, right? And then we published a Docker app. Now I should just mention when we're building containers, we build it using cache. You can override that if you need to, but that means that only the, the thing that changed in the container is going to be uh, delivered to the platform. So it, it saves bandwidth and it also saves uh, space on the device. So let's go ahead and take a look here. So we'll do our list command again. And we should see a new build, uh, 64. Yep, okay. So build 64 is available and let's just show here status is we're on 63. And if we do docker ps-a, we still have something running. So this is gonna be interesting, let's see what happens. So if we go update, which is gonna bring us up to 64, which will have the change that we pushed in the Docker app. So this is just configuration, should be fairly quick. Uh, it'll bring the service down for a moment, bring it right back up and display our new content. And so we were able to, to make changes by simply get pushing to uh, an application and uh, having it delivered to platforms. Now, how does this scale? Well, every device you register and you set to listen to one of those apps uh, will pick this up. So you can deploy this to a large amount of devices in the field using a single process. Now, again, I will mention, I'm running this in manual mode with Actualizer Lite. This typically uh, from our factory builds will run as a daemon mode. So it will just automatically happen. Um, I will mention, we have documentation on how you control this update process. So uh, you can essentially grab file locks and stop the process from downloading an update if it sees one, and you can grab another file lock if you would like to wait to actually reboot the platform until your, your application's ready. So if you have a centralized application that you're using for control, a good example I like to use is if, you're, if you have an autonomous robot, uh, you don't wanna just take an update uh, if you're out in the field running on battery. You want to wait till you're probably back at a docking station and you have over 60 percent battery then you want to take uh, an update and, and vice versa if you if you're out in the field running on battery you don't want to be downloading an update on wi-fi uh, using power and potentially you could go out of wi-fi range and then back in um, which os tree handles very well but uh you know it's still something that's not needed until you're absolutely ready for it so okay um our update is completed our hdmi app uh here with using cute uh has updated and we have our new um uh, text display. Pretty cool, right? Um, so let's do some extra credit. I, I don't know if anybody was paying too close of attention, but um, let's look at what a, like a really complicated service might look like. Um, so you can see this open thread gateway uh, Docker app here, and I'm going to go ahead and go to the screen here and point out this little USB dongle uh, that's connected to the Apollo board here. That's a, an NRF52840 uh, Nordic dongle running open thread firmware. And OpenThread is, is uh, 802.15.4 radio um, that uses uh, like a, a mesh-like connection system uh, to provide, uh, you know, uh, IP services to connected devices. Now, what does that actually look like? And before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, get this thing going here. It does. There's a whole bunch of services involved with this. So I'm going to do the same thing that I did before to add the Python Qt application, except now I'm going to drop in this. And we'll do an update. And it says, hey, you know, hey, this is new. This is new app now, uh, OpenThread Gateway. I, I want to try it out. So it's going to pull these containers down and it's going to start them up. And now, what does that actually look like, right? So this is my OpenThread Docker or OpenThread Gateway Docker app definition. Um, 
a lot more services here. So there's actually, I think, five containers in this service. So we have the interface monitor for OpenThread. Uh, got a whole bunch of different options. We have the WPAN module uh, here. We've got the DNS64 service, so for name resolution. Uh, Jewel is the uh, module that allows us, so this is actually talking to a kernel module uh, that, that's been added to this platform. So this doesn't ship with Horizon, but it was something that was easy to add for us. Uh, and then we have a proxy so that we can proxy co-op. So that is, you know, kind of an example of maybe a service that is uh, much more complex than what we had done with our prototype. But just to show you that, you know, this this is actually uh, something that can be done. So you can see here, uh, I already pre-pulled the container so we didn't have to sit around and wait uh, for all of that. But this uh, will now, yep, so it checked to make sure that there was no Python Qt uh, application updates and uh, we're off to the races here. So let's just take a quick look. Yeah, look at all those containers. Okay, I'm gonna put some badges out here now. Hopefully you guys can see them better in the daylight uh, than last time. So I'll put one here too, just so we can, and maybe another one for good measure. So these are all running uh, NR52840 modules as well, and they're gonna speak open thread, and they're gonna to connect to this device while our QT app is still running. So maybe if this was a kiosk and then you had wireless sensors that you wanted to uh, connect with, uh, this would be an interesting use case for you. So these are gonna use lwm to m which is lightweight machine to machine protocol. It's again, another open protocol, and connect to the cloud side. So it's just, it does take a few minutes for uh, this to work, and then we can actually show live streaming data um, from, from these devices once they connect. Okay, looks like they're actually connected already. So here's our three devices. Um, and what you can see, I'm gonna try to find one of them. Let's see which one we got here. Okay, let's do this one. Um, so I briefly want to talk about LWMDEM. It's not really relevant to this, but it, it's, so each one of these operations is an LWMDEM object. They're well-defined interfaces. So this is like the temp, ambient temp sensor right here. Uh, we have a service already watching the temp sensor, so it can uh, stream live sensor data, and that's actually Grafana here. So this is the ref refreshing every five seconds, sampling that sensor. You can see it, we weren't getting anything, and then all of a sudden when OpenThread came up, we're, we're getting live sensor data now. Um, we have light control, but we also have this like uh, this daylight readable text display that's kind of neat. So we can say, you know, Toradex, and we can update that. Now, if we go back to our camera here, which one updated? Now it's this guy right here. So let me zoom in. Kind of hard to see, but we were able to change that display very, very quickly, uh, you know, over, over, over open thread network. So you know, this is kind of what you got. We have all of these three sensors now connected, uh, and now we're managing this. So if we have to update this deployment in the field, if we have to change our Python Qt application, we can do so without interrupting uh, this open thread deployment. And I think that's really powerful because you know, in, in the past, uh, you know, embedded systems have been really, really tied together, especially at the operating system level. So to update, you know, one service or one daemon on that device, sometimes it could interrupt the services that were also running alongside of that. Now with containers and Docker apps and this managed thing, uh, these are these are kind of like separate pieces that are like multi-tenant almost uh, that, that may have effects on each other if they're linked together like the open thread services. But if you have the QT app like we're showing here, you know, there's really no ties to, to, the, to the open thread uh, setup as well. So... Uh, with that, I believe that's kind of the end of our demo here. Um, I did, I already went through kind of the factory walkthrough. So I'll go ahead and hand this back over to Daniel to see if there's any questions. Thanks so much, Tyler. Uh, yeah, there's some question and also maybe I uh, repeat it for people who joined a little bit later. So we have now a live Q&A. So if you have any question, uh, feel free to use the question feature of the webinar tool. It's a chat box, so you can uh, enter your question and then we will pick it up here and answer it uh, live for you. Um, so let me get started here. Tell us more about the Docker ecosystem. Um, okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's take a quick look at Docker Hub. I mean, the ecosystem has gotten a lot better. Um, let's see, wait, wait, wait. Let's see. SQL. that's a great one. Let's see what, so a lot of, companies are coming like like microsoft's github uh you know they have a ton of offerings uh through them uh any any large open source uh company is seeming to have a presence on on docker hub so i believe that the the ecosystem is actually one of the better ones for if you look at container runtimes uh you know i'd say you know snappy's up there uh with having a, a bigger broader ecosystem but what i what i like about docker is they're kind of thinking uh in terms now of, of how how you secure 
uh, you know, these, these applications and how you audit them. So I can give you a quick example of kind of how we do this because we're very security minded uh, when we, we do these containers. Um, so what we typically do uh, for ours is we, you know, we post which architecture we build for. And then within the architecture, we actually do vulnerability scans so that we can, uh, you know, you can actually see what CVEs are inside your container uh, because while containers are very handy, uh, every one of them is kind of a unique thing and needs to be treated uh, with the same security practices you would give to your base operating system. So uh, the ecosystem is great to a point where I think maybe some people are pretty lax on security or don't really understand what they're running in containers and that can be dangerous. And so uh, we need to have the right, you know, tooling in place to really guide us, uh, you know, down the right path there. But uh, yeah, I'm very excited. I've been in with the Docker ecosystems and, and big into Kubernetes, uh, you know, for the last five years. So it's great to see the, the the community and the ecosystem grow in the way it has. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe added from Toradex. So Toradex also works with components more like focus on the embedded market, you know, where Toradex uh, a target customers are like codices, which is a soft PLC, a real time soft PLC. We have Qt, the, the UI framework, Crank, another UI framework, and there are many more to come where we directly work with them to provide basically um, uh, Docker content which are tested for Torizon. Um, then here, the next one, uh, is it possible to update firmware software on the devices that are connected to gateway demo board? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, yeah, so I'm sharing my screen right now. Um, you can't, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, it says, you know, I just changed the, the, the text display there. Uh, I can actually show you how this works. So uh, we use LWM to M on the, the RTOS side, um, and LWM to M is, again, an open protocol that allows you to define, uh, you know, objects and then just implement the back end behind there. And so one of the objects that we, we have is firmware update. So um, through a Toradex gateway, running that open thread dongle with three devices connected to it, uh, you know, you can send a package. So like, what would you do is you'd put your URL in for your signed firmware. So uh, each one of these RTOS is run as a secure bootloader that will validate uh, firmware signatures. Uh, so you have to provide a package that's, that's properly signed. Uh, you can provide that package and then you can actually execute the update. Uh, the, the UI behind LaShawn or this LWM dem server is just a test server, but it gives you an idea of the, of the the back end uh, uh, that's available to you. So like things like the addressable text display, I just updated one of them, but we can go back to another one of these devices and um, there's four devices on here. I got to pick the right one. And that one's the one there. So yeah, you can update the firmware devices through the gateway um, using all of the software. And, and that's something else that, that we, we offer as well. Okay, good. Then going to the next question, how do you update bootloaders? Ah, that's a very, very good question. I'm glad somebody asked, asked that. Uh, it is hardware specific. So typically on the Toradex modules, uh, they have two different slots for firmware and that you can write into either one of them and then tell the boot ROM which one to, to load. Um, the problem with that is it is prone uh, to to bricking stuff. If that if that bootloader update doesn't work, uh, you know, then it does take some physical intervention uh, to get back into the other slot. Now you're not completely bricked, but uh, you know, uh, an over-the-air update like that is is a little risky. So typically, we don't update the boot firmware as often uh, as we can, and we try to mitigate risk by doing so. Um, but yeah, the, it, it depends on the platform, uh, like the Intel platform is obviously a lot easier because everything's standardized on the embedded platform, depending if you're running uh, U-Boot or UEFI and, and what hardware configuration and who built your SOC, all those factors come into play. Um, we do offer professional services to, to make sure, uh, you know, those things work properly if, if it's something that you're interested in on a specific hardware platform. Yeah. And I mean, for the Toradex, uh, of course, for us, that's very important. As you could see, uh, we are typically in really critical uh, industry like factory automation and stuff like that. So, so for us, uh, there is a lot of focus on having an extreme stable uh, OTA solution. And that's also the reason we went here with a little bit the more complicated one, uh, but to, to ensure uh, stability. And then the next question here, do you use a symmetric AB dual boot for updating the operation system? 
Uh, that's a good question. So no, we don't use AB. It's all incremental and it's based on OS tree. So if you think of OS tree as like a, like Git, uh, it's, it's version control uh, for your file system essentially. And so that means that any changes you make to the file system can be delivered incrementally and in a single partition. Yeah, but well, at the same time, uh, providing the you know the security, but basically, uh, it's a, it's a atomic update, right? So Absolutely. you don't you know you're not worry about damage damaging in. And also, if you're a little bit more interested in that, on the Toradex side, on the Horizon page, if you search for Toradex Horizon, I hope you will find it. You will also see for our embedded world demos where we do from the Toradex side some demos about power cuts and really some critical stuff. Because we know this is a huge focus of our target customers. Uh, and then how, how the devices are regis registering on the platform at first boot? Ah, good question. So I'll show this video again. We kind of skipped through it a little bit. So I'll skip ahead if I can here. Maybe I can't. I think it's just going to play out. Anyways, so this is just provisioning with Easy Installer. Just take a moment. We sped this this footage up. The next thing you're going to see is uh, a terminal window where I've SSH'd over Ethernet uh, into the board, and I run a command to register. And that command uh, will output the URL, which I need to go activate the, the device registration. So here we go. We have a tool in the image called LMP Device Register, which you run, and you give this platform a name. So it's not automatically registering first boot. You have to opt in to do it. So you give it a name. So it's a Apollos IMX 603. Uh, it spits out a URL, which is appfoundries.io slash activate. You drop the user code in there, which is the challenge, and then you connect the device. And on the device side, it gets the challenge back, validates everything, installs the TLS keys, and now the device is registered. Okay, good. And then here, next question, how does one get the Toradex Easy Installer? Uh, so maybe I can answer that. This okay. pre-installed. So all our modules, uh, if you buy them, they come with Toradex Easy Installer and it's really a nice tool getting started with Foundries uh, or getting started with many of our other partner or our tool, uh, our images, but it's also a good tool for a volume production programming. So it's really designed for that. Um, and it's, it's pre-installed. Um, where to download the image for Torex Easy Installer? So I, I think the problem in the, you know, the, the, the first image you installed. Ah, so if that's the case, uh, you'd have to set up a factory. Uh, I guess we could make that public image. If we make your factory public, we could uh, offer that image. It's something that we don't have right now. It's kind of a personal factory. Um, but if you're interested in getting that set up, uh, just contact me or Daniel and we can uh, get you started. Yeah. And so we're working on making that easy available for everybody. So for the moment, if you have, if you want to get started with that, just write us in and we get you uh, set up with it. Yeah. Um, um, if you, if you actually want to get started, you can go to our website. So, oops, excuse me, founders.io. Uh, and you, if you sign up here, so, oops, I'm logged in, but it'll give you a, uh, an ability to create an account. And if you do create an account, you'll be able to get back here and you'll be able to just click on a factory and create your own factory and then do a subscription and we can help you. You can just open a support ticket and we'll, uh, we'll allow you to bring the Toradex stuff in and uh, use it and configure it for those modules. Okay. What modules are supported with Torizon slash Foundries? Um, yeah, so for Toradex, basically all the latest modules are supported. So the, the really new one uh, from the from the Horizon side is Apollis IMX8, the, the brand new uh, module. And there is also a webinar coming up about that if you like to learn more. Then what we showed here is IMX6 space. So we have the Apollis form factor and we have um, a Colibri form factor and we have the IMX6 and the IMX7 also running at Horizon. Yeah, and in addition to that, on the Foundry side, we you know we support multiple multiple architectures. So we have support for Intel. Um, we track the mainline kernel, uh, so we usually run the latest Linux kernel. So if you're if you have hardware that is supported upstream in the Linux kernel, it's fairly easy to add to either Horizon or uh, um, the 
Linux micro platform. So we, we are in GitHub um, and all of the platform is open source. So there's no lock in there. If you go to GitHub Founders IO, uh, you can open pull requests or you can see all the source, but uh, this gives you an idea of what other platforms we have. So we, we even support RISC five. So we've got a 64 bit RISC five uh, software implementation that does everything that you just saw minus the containers. Uh, obviously the Toradex uh, SOMs and, and carrier boards, along with the, you know, your low cost development boards like Raspberry Pis and Beagle Bones. Uh, and the great part is, is it runs the same software across all of them. So, uh, you know, keeping, you know, security auditing, uh, you know, across multiple architectures, it, it simplifies that process. So uh, if there's a specific hardware that you would like to see supported uh, in either Terizon or, or Linux micro platform, please reach out. Uh, it's something that we can do fairly easily. Okay, thanks. Next is, is OS3 able to do pre-function script like package managers before doing update? I don't believe so. I believe that there has been discussion um, on, you know, some of the GitHub issues and, and mailing lists around OS tree about potentially having that. Uh, however, Actualizer, the client that does apply the OS tree has those hooks for pre and post conditions. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be an OS tree, but it could be any sort of uh, update that triggers a pre and post condition. So we have here one question, uh, what happens between queued and passed? I guess this reference to um, uh, one of the UIs you showed, uh, where you saw like queued and passed. Passed. Passed, yeah. So it's probably when you sh uh, showed the CI, maybe? Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so yeah, um, that's that's an interesting one. So we can, we can take a look at that. Um, so let's take a look at the logs. I need to refresh these. There we go. Okay, so what happens was we've already built the Qt app, right? So when we pushed it, it gets built. Now, um, I was talking about caching earlier, and I'll kind of give you an example of this. So we know the last image that was built, right? That was built in the system. If one doesn't exist, there is no cache to use. So, uh, you know, we don't need to pull it. But in this case, there was this application already built. So we pull in the old one, and then we build the new one with the cache, right? Uh, in this case, there wasn't any change to that application because it was already built in our system. So we just tagged it with the new SHA. So uh, what ends up happening is, I can't really see, but here's the new SHA. So this is what it ends up being uh, when, it, when it's published, right? And so if we go in the device, I think this might be kind of interesting. Um, So this is where they all get put. And if we go to Python Qt app, here is the Docker app file that lives on the device. Now notice this SHA here is exactly this SHA here for this, this image and tag. So uh, that's what gets pushed out of the device. And then, oops, excuse me. And if we also cat the Docker compose, so we, we render, Docker apps render a compose file at the end with all of the parameterizations in here. And then that's actually what gets run. So hopefully that answers your question. If you've got a follow up to that one, um, go ahead and put it in the chat and we can try to address that. Okay, and then here the next one says, can you go through the pricing again? Abs absolutely. So let's, it's probably easiest to just go to our website here. Um, so well, we have three levels. We try to simplify this community edition, free use, Free is in free beer. Um, public source code, so not now. Uh, everything we offer on this platform is open on GitHub. So you can go there, you can fork it to your heart's content. You can sell us, send us pull requests if you'd like uh, to add new hardware functionality uh, or whatnot. Um, don't need anything. You can literally, um, and I'll show you on the docs too, because this is something. So if you, you're a community user, you just want to get started with this, here is an entire guide to walk you through, you know, installing the Linux micro platform, our public build, uh, being able to pull Docker apps down. Uh, so we, we provide the open thread gateway one as, as an example. X kiosk is kind of like kiosk mode, but displays a website. And then there's just like a shell HTTPD uh, Docker app um, that allows you to enable them and pull them down uh, and have a curated experience. Now, if you want to move to the personal edition, which is $10 a month or, or $89 a year, you get a little bit of um, a discount if you, if you prepay annually, you get everything that the community edition has been done. Now you get your own personal Foundries factory. So this means you can take the Linux micro platform or you can take Terizon and you can put, you know, a different kernel or, or add different kernel modules or change anything you want about the platform and manage it yourself. So you get the code hosting, you get the Docker app store, you get the Docker registry and you get the build system. 
Uh, you get three builds per day and you can manage up to 10 devices. You also get a Slack channel where we can support you and then you can ask questions and things like that. Um, and then you have the commercial use one. So this is, this is uh, unlimited builds, unlimited devices. Uh, you get on-device testing. So a lot of um, like what we built in the frameworks with using OTA, we actually use for testing. So we can, uh, with OS tree, swap from build to build very easily. And it's got rollback support. So if, if a build doesn't work, we can easily roll it back and uh, you know, complete the testing that way. So you get that personalized for you. So you can add your own hardware devices. Let's say you make uh, a new carrier board for one of the Tordex SOMs that you need device tree support, uh, easily adding that into your build, uh, enabling that, and then being able to run tests on that board uh, using our platform is something that we offer as well. We also uh, offer securable devices and auditing. So uh, I can kind of show you what you get there. So our containers are public ones, like we do uh, CVE audit auditing. So you can see each version, what, what CVEs are in them. Uh, we do that for your customer applications and we do it for your platform. So we actually run uh, you know, firmware analyzer on your Yocto build and let you know if there's any uh, packages that, that have vulnerabilities in them as well. So you get that uh, with the enterprise edition and you get priority support. So you have, we have a ticketing system and then we, you'll have a dedicated Slack channel where you can ask questions. Um, all of this is self-serve. So if you go sign in um, in the docs actually here, there's a whole getting started on how to sign up, how to set your, how to create your factory, uh, how to, how do you do your subscription and all that stuff. And then in the end, you will actually have your own self-serve uh, factory where you can make all these changes and manage devices. So, we, you know, and I think maybe one thing else to, to just quickly talk about is what hardware we support. So uh, Tordex hardware, IMX6, IMX7, very well supported. Um, any Intel platform basically that, that uh, supports UEFI, the above a core to do a plus, um, and then we even support RISC-V as well. So we have a Quemu, uh, uh build, and we also have uh, Sci-5, Hi-5 Unleashed, if you have that hardware. Uh, and then a, a series of other BeagleBone, uh, you know, black wireless and other develop, low-cost development boards. Now, we track the mainline kernel. We, we release it with the latest uh, released version of the Linux, or the Linux kernel. So if your platform has upstream uh, support, it's very easy to add support into a Linux micro platform for your particular platform. If you have to use a vendor kernel, again, with the Foundry's factory, it's easy to swap a kernel in as well. So uh, hopefully that answers your question and maybe a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, if you have a follow up, please put it in the chat and we can address it then. Okay, thanks a lot, Tyler. Uh, maybe a few words here from, from the Toradex side. Uh, Horizon Core, so the, the software running on the module, that's free from Toradex, so we don't charge uh, for any of the software and about hardware support for Horizon, exactly like Tyler said, it's our iMix 6 modules, iMix 7 modules, and our new now also an iMix 8, like the iMix 8 uh, caught next. Good, and next question, uh, when the demo? <laughs> I think it probably means, uh, you know, the demo you showed or what you loaded with Toradex Easy Installer, uh, where, where can they get that? Or Right. Okay. So that is, uh, you get that, those images produced when you do your first factory build. Um, so I actually, um, I don't have a good example of this. Maybe I can show with one of my, um, uh, let's do, I think this is, this is my factory that I've just set up, uh, that I pay $10 a month for here. Okay, so this is kind of what, what it'll look like uh, when you first set it up. So when you go sign up and you add your subscription, uh, about 30 minutes later, you'll get this. And, and right now it's configured to run a Raspberry Pi 364 bit because that's typically the platform that, uh, that everybody has. We have documentation that, that describes on how you change your platform. Um, but that, this, is, this image here, if you were to configure it for an Apollos IMX6, would give you the easy installer image that you can just put on a USB key and insert into the platform and provision your Tordex device. So um, yeah, it basically will come out of the pre-built binary here. Uh, and I think what we can do is I can add a bit of documentation exactly what um, artifact you need to use on the USB stick to make it a little bit easier. Let me know if that didn't answer your question. And then the next question from the same person, it says, I see you can update a QMU as well. Anything special about this? Uh, yes. So uh, on the ARM64, 
Quemu implementation. I don't think there's any restrictions really. On the RISC V Quemu instance, if that's something that you're interested in, the reset uh, driver appears to be broken in the kernel. So when you reboot the platform, it actually crashes, it panics when it is the, the kernel reboots. So you kind of have to manually kill the Quemu process and then start it up again, uh, and it'll update. So. Uh, I should mention also on RISC V, it does not have a Golang port yet, so we can't do anything with Docker, but we can still deliver uh, over the air updates on RISC V uh, using OS Tree. Okay, good from the same person, very excellent demo and product. So he seems like happy with your answers. And then question here, Foundry's IO is based on BitBake question mark, or is it completely different than Yocto? No, it is 100% Yocto. In fact, let me, um. Let me just go to one of the platform builds here because I think that would uh, would help a little bit. And if we look at one of the platform builds here, and we actually look at the logs, uh, we build this in a container. But uh, you know, here is so this is the repo manifest that you would use typically. Uh, this sh this should be uh, very familiar to you. I mean, this is, here's our targets that we're gonna build with BitBake. Uh, here's our machine, here's the SDK, and, and here's our distribution, right? Uh, it is exactly like using Yocto and Open Embedded and BitBake to build everything. Uh, there's no differences. It's just, it happens in the cloud instead of having to build it on your desk, which you can still do. Uh, and one nice thing I think uh, about some of these runs and the way we built our CI system is how many times have you uh, wanted to reproduce a build in CI exactly on your desk, right? Because there might be a tooling issue between your local dev environment and uh, you know what's happening in the cloud. So if you actually click this button that says uh, execute and simulator, it gives you a shell script that you can copy and paste and run. And since we use Docker to build with, it's a reproducible environment. Um, you can build exactly the same thing that happened in the cloud on your desk uh, and then and debug it. Uh, so I, I find this to be very, very useful uh, when, when creating factories. So uh, another little value add, now you do have to put your, your access token in, which is documented in the documentation on how to, how to get one of those so that you can pull all your builds in, uh, because remember, uh, you get a private space for each factory. So uh, absolutely, now there's nothing stopping you from building this locally. If you already know how to build uh, Yocto and Open Embedded, you can just simply clone the manifest and run BitBake, and you're off and running. Okay, thanks a lot. Then here another question. Are price reduced plans available for non-profit projects? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, so we do, I believe on our pricing page, at the very bottom here, or maybe we didn't have this in here, um, but we, if you if you have like an educational use, uh, come talk to us uh, or your nonprofit. Uh, come talk to us. We want to get you, uh, you know, using the software and 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 getting other people to use it too. So uh, if you have a specific need, um, yeah, just reach out to me or Daniel, and uh, we can get you in touch with the right people and help you out with that. Now, if you're a startup and you're less than ten people, we offer a fifty percent discount on our. Uh, I think that might be in the pricing section here. Let me just double check. Yeah, so uh, we can we can do some some work with the educational use, but you get a fifty percent discount for two years if you're running a startup, which is less than ten employees. So you get that uh, five thousand dollars down to twenty five hundred dollars a month to to help you know uh, bootstrap that. So yeah, again, come talk to us if you if you got specific needs, and we'd be more than welcome to help. Uh, good. Then uh, hear about support for other hardware like the the ST thirty two MP one. So it's not a talk it all product doesn't feature uh, that currently, but yeah, uh, what would be support? Uh, it says it use open embedded Yocto. Yeah, so as long as it has a, a, a recent enough kernel, I believe that thing's going to use a vendor kernel from ST, which isn't a problem. Uh, it's easily importable into your factory. So uh, there will be an, a little bit of integration work that you need to do, but you can use your factory to support that platform. And if that's something that you, you want help with, we do offer professional services to help you integrate. Um, but if you know what you're doing and you just need a place to do it, um, we can provide that as well. And also a question, uh, slides later in an email, and um, yeah, just to repeat that, uh, if you, we will send out an email where you can download um, the slides and, and the whole presentation as a video. Um, good, let me see. I think that's it. I think also time-wise, we're pretty much uh, over. So let me know if you have more questions. I'll give you another uh, few seconds. And otherwise, uh, we will conclude the webinar here. 
Uh, thanks a lot for uh, Tyler to, uh, for presenting and to all of you for joining and your time. And I hope you learned something. And if you need more information, uh, please reach out uh, to Foundries and Torlex and, and we are happy to help you uh, uh, to get started with that. Okay, yeah, I think there is no more questions. So, so thanks again and enjoy your Friday. Great. Thank you.